Hey everyone, welcome to Big Picture Monday. My name is Callie Black and I love telling stories about the scriptures. So I'm here to tell you what's going on in this week's Come Follow Me reading, which is 1 Samuel chapters 8 through 10, 13, and 15 through 18. And after I tell you the story version of it, then when you study your scriptures this week, it's going to be a lot easier to not have to focus on the comprehension and instead be able to enjoy what the actual lessons are that you can be learning from these concepts. And I love seeing how everything fits together in the big picture. That is like my thing is what is the big picture of how this all connects? And then also on the other hand, what are then the little pictures? What are the, the spiritual applications? What's happening chapter by chapter? And that's what I love sharing um, on Instagram and um, in my study guides. The next study guide is available very soon here. Um, so if you're looking for third quarter study guide that I create, those are my big picture, little picture study guides that will take you through July, August, and September of this year. And boy, are we studying some amazing chapters in the next three months. Um, we go into the poetry books and I will totally walk you through, you know, Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. And then we even start Isaiah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I'm here to help you again connect the big picture as well as the little picture. We even get a whole bunch of history as well, learning about the two kingdoms of Israel and how the official scattering of Israel um, and what that actually looked like and the temple being destroyed. There's a whole bunch of history as well. Basically, we're studying like a lot of very random, not random, but different topics this next quarter. And I'm excited to walk you through that. That will be available on Amazon in physical copy or as a digital download on my website. Either way, I'll give you all the details as soon as it's available. So look out for that. Okay, but let's talk about this week. Last week we ended up, remember we had Hannah and she had been praying for a son. She had gone to the tabernacle um, and she had been blessed with a son, little boy named Samuel. And then she was able to dedicate her son to the Lord and Eli was the priest of the temple. But remember Eli's sons were not super righteous. They were working in the temple with him. And it seems like Eli allowed this. So the Lord had, we learned last week, had kind of said, Eli, I'm going to have to find someone new to replace you. And he had called Samuel to be Eli's replacement um, as the new prophet and judge of all of Israel. Remember when I say judge, think military leader. So he is a prophet and also a judge. That's what Samuel is called as. And that's where we left off last week. Now, we do skip a few chapters, just a few chapters before we pick up this week. So I want to fill you in on what we skip. Basically, the Philistines, remember the Philistines, they're an outside group outside of Israel, not Israelites. They come to attack. And if you remember, when the Israelites are going out in battle, they have priests that carry the Ark of the Covenant out in front. Remember that? Well, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant were Eli's sons because they were the priests of the temple. But those are not righteous people. They were not making good choices. And so the Philistines win and they capture the Ark of the Covenant. They take the Ark of the Covenant and they take it back to their lands. Now, of course, the Lord was not happy with Eli's sons and actually they were all killed in that battle. Um, but the Lord was also not happy with the Philistines who stole the Ark of the Covenant. And the Philistines noticed that anywhere that they put the Ark was immediately cursed. And so they actually gave the Ark of the Covenant back to the Israelites. They're like, mm, we don't want this. Thanks. <laughs> we won the battle, but you can have the Ark of the Covenant back. <laughs> um, so Eli's sons died. We also learned that Eli died as well. So this now brings Samuel to the forefront. He really is the leader. Um, and Samuel actually leads the Israelites to victory in a battle. So go Samuel. He's, he's doing good things. Now, when we pick up in chapter 8, it talks about how now Samuel is getting old in age. So we've got lots of time jumps going on here. Um, we don't obviously get every detail of Samuel's life. It seems like he was just a little boy last week being dropped off at the tabernacle. And here he is, an old man. Um, and he actually anoints his sons to become judges over Israel as well. But his sons are not super righteous. And so the people actually come to Samuel and say, listen, Samuel, we want a king. Have you heard people ask that before in the scriptures? How does that go for them? <laughs> um, basically, Samuel goes to the Lord and says, listen, everyone's asking for a king. And the Lord says, okay, you need to like tell them, give them the warnings, tell them all the 
bad things about having a king, especially a wicked king. Um, but at the end of the day, if that's what they want, they can have that. So Samuel goes back to the people and is like, listen, if you have a king, here's some things that could happen. And everyone's like, yeah, we understand. We still want a king. That's, that's what we want. Um, and so chapter nine, we learn about a man named Saul. And Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. And he one day lost his dad's donkeys. So he's going around, he has a servant with him and these they're looking in all these places trying to find Saul's dad's donkeys. And the servant at one point says, listen, we are right here and I know there's a prophet named Samuel, like he's right by us. Why don't we go ask him because he could tell us where the donkeys are. Now, at the same time, Samuel the prophet is being told by the Lord, there's going to be a man who comes to you named Saul and he's going to be the first king of Israel. He's going to be the guy that you anoint to be the first king of Israel. So Samuel, uh, Saul is like, all right, let's go find this prophet to ask where my donkeys are. And so he goes and to find Samuel and they talk and Samuel's asking Saul lots of questions. They're having great discussions and he invites him for dinner. And then um, he even says, I, I want to talk with you more tomorrow. And so in chapter uh, 10, they talk again in the morning and that's it. Samuel anoints Saul to be the first king of Israel. And Saul is like completely converted. Now, when I say king of Israel in the scriptures, it says like captain over all Israel, but that's what it means. We're talking about the king here. Um, Saul is converted and he receives the Holy Ghost. He prophesies. Oh, he does also learn where the donkeys are. So he's able to go return the donkeys to his dad. Like, whoops, got to do that part too. Um, and then he meets with other prophets and he's prophesying with them. And he really is um, being fully converted. He's all in with the Lord. And so at the end, um, Samuel gathers all the tribes together and presents them Saul as their king and he anoints him officially as the king and all the tribes recognize that and here we are we are now in the section of the reign of the kings the time of the kings in the land of israel with saul being our very first king all right um we skip a few chapters here where Saul is like leading everyone to victory. He's teaching everyone about Christ. He's pointing everyone towards the savior. You've got to be righteous. That's how we stay victorious against our enemies. Let's do this gung ho. Things are starting off fantastic for Saul. Then we get to read chapter 13. And this is actually the first kind of misstep that Saul makes. They're ready to go to battle against the Philistines, of course. The Philistines just love going to battle against the Israelites, um, cannot leave them alone. And so Samuel had told Saul, listen, I will come before you start your battle. I will come and make a burnt offering to the Lord. That's what he would do as the prophet. Um, I will come make a burnt offering and then you guys can be successful in your battle. Well, Saul is there with all his troops. He's the one leading the charge and Samuel's late. And Saul is like, we've got to get going here. We've got to do something. And so Saul decides on his own to make the burnt offering. He does this without proper priesthood authority, without proper priesthood authorization. He makes the burnt offering on his own. Now, when Samuel does eventually get there, he learns about what Saul did. And he um, tells Saul, the Lord is very displeased with what you chose to do. He's going to have to pick a new king. Um, we do skip chapter 14, which is just another misstep that Saul makes. He basically, he makes his men um, fast during a battle, and that includes his son, Jonathan. He has a son named Jonathan, and it really starts to turn public opinion against Saul. We skip over that one, but we do pick it up in chapter 15 with yet another misstep. And in chapter 15, the Amalekites come to battle. And when the Amalekites come to battle, um, Samuel prophesies and tells Saul, okay, you're going to go to battle against the Amalekites. You have to destroy them all. Don't take anyone. Don't take anything. Destroy literally everything. So Saul goes into battle against the Amalekites, but they capture the king. They capture him alive. And they also keep all of the sheep and the cattle. We, they keep them al alive too, and they take them. And so when they go back to Samuel, Samuel's like, mm, what did I tell you to do? And Saul is like proud at first. He's like, listen, 
we got all of these animals so that we can make sacrifices. Like you got to have animals every time you make a burnt offering, right? So like we are ready to make sacrifices and now we have tons of new animals to use as the sacrifices. So this is actually a great thing. And Samuel is like, mm, actually, that was not a great thing because to obey the Lord is better than making sacrifices. Um, and this kind of is like the final straw. Samuel at this point, the prophet says, you are no longer the king of Israel. You no longer have the Lord's backing. Um, and as far as we know, Samuel and Saul don't ever actually interact after this point again. Now, just to be clear, because I know when I was reading this, I'm like, wait, so Saul isn't the king anymore? Like what happens? Because as I still was reading, Saul continues to act like the king. So basically what Samuel the prophet is telling King Saul is you no longer have God's authority to act as the prophet. You no longer have priesthood power behind what you're doing. Um, you cannot do what you're doing in the name of the Lord. Um, Saul is still the king and he will act as the king until he dies. So it's not like that was an immediate removal from his power. Um, instead, that's just saying that the Lord is not backing what Saul is doing. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, the difference is there. Um, so going into chapter 16, Samuel is now on a journey to find the next king because he now needs to anoint a new king. Even though that new king isn't going to actually take over as the king right now, the Lord needs someone to give, you know, the power and authority of becoming the next king, um, too. And so Samuel ends up going to a place called Bethlehem and he finds a man named Jesse. Now, remember last week when we studied the story of Ruth and Naomi, where was their hometown? Bethlehem. Ruth married Boaz, right? They had a son named Obed and Obed had a son named Jesse. So Jesse, the man that they, that um, the prophet Samuel comes to find in first Samuel here is the grandson of Ruth and Boaz. And Samuel comes to Jesse and says, hey, gather all your sons together. Um, and Jesse's like, okay, here's all my sons. And Samuel kind of goes down the line and is like, yeah, it's none of these guys are you sure you're not missing anyone? And Jesse's like, well, I do have my youngest son who's like out with the sheep, but that's not very important, right? And Samuel's like, mm, yeah, go grab him. <laughs> so Jesse goes and gets his youngest son named David. And as soon as Samuel sees David, he knows that David is the one who should be anointed to be the new king of Israel. And it happens right then and there. Samuel anoints David, we don't know how young he was, uh, we assume a young man of some kind, uh, he anoints David to be the king of Israel. Now, just to be clear, this doesn't mean that David, this young sheep herder, immediately becomes the king of Israel. It just means that he now has God's authority to eventually one day become the king of Israel. And of course, we will see how that all happens. Um, pretty interesting. Now, in still in chapter 16, at the same time, we learn that Saul, King Saul, loses the spirit and he feels kind of this darkness and so he's like I need some light in my life is there like a heart player or anyone who can bring some some goodness and everyone's like oh listen there's this sheep herder named David and he's an amazing harpist and so King Saul invites David to his court and David plays the harp and he just brings the spirit and this light like it's pretty clear that this kid David has the power of God with him which he does absolutely um, and Saul just loves David. He loves David. Absolutely. Okay. Chapter 17. This is a pretty famous chapter, um, but it's kind of cool to see how it all fits in with the context. David goes back home to Bethlehem. He's with his dad, sheep herding, and the Philistines. They come to battle again, again against the Israelites. And um, what happens is they're lined up. They're ready to go to battle. And the Philistines send out one man, one man with the name of Goliath. And Goliath comes out and says, listen, let's make this easy. You send one person to fight me. Whoever wins, the other people will become servants to those people. I will stand here for 40 days. You have 40 days to figure out who's going to battle against me. Um, so basically, we just have the Israelites 
frozen and they don't know what to do. Now, in the meantime, David had a whole bunch of brothers, right? David's three older brothers were out on the battlefield and David is at home with his dad herding sheep, but his dad decides to send some food to the brothers on the battle line, which I just feel like is a very relatable thing to <laughs> need to do. So David comes over to the battlefield with a whole bunch of food from their dad from Bethlehem. And while he's giving the food out, he hears Goliath's taunting. And David is like, well, I'll go to battle against him. I know I have the spirit of the Lord with me. And if I have the spirit of the Lord with me, I know that I can win. He shows fantastic, just unbelievable faith in the Lord. And so he does. Saul approves and David goes out onto the battlefield and Goliath is just taunting him like crazy. But David still bears testimony that he knows the Lord will help him win. Now, David brings out onto the battlefield with him five stones and a slingshot. And he takes one stone with a slingshot. He hits Goliath. Goliath passes out. And then he goes to Goliath, takes Goliath's sword and cuts off Goliath's head. And then the Israelites go at it. The Philistines turn and run and the Israelites pursue them and they are able to conquer the Philistines in battle. And then in our final chapter this week, chapter 18, it now seems like David is um, at the king's court, you know, with, with King Saul. And, um, you know, King Saul is a huge fan of David. This is fantastic. And David has now become really good friends with Jonathan. Remember, Jonathan is King Saul's son. So David and Jonathan are becoming like really good friends. And he starts to really grow affection for one of King Saul's daughters um, and is interested in marrying her. But then we learn that there's a bunch of women in the land who are singing the praises of David. David, saying that David is the mightiest warrior in all the land. Now, how do you think King Saul feels about that? Not great. In fact, this starts to really fester. Um, King Saul really does not like this. It gets to the point where Saul is working to try and get David killed. He wants David gone out of the picture. And at one point he says, all right, David, let's make you a captain. We need to go to battle. Let's go out to battle. Um, and you're going to be a captain, basically hoping that he's going to meet his demise out on the battlefield. But with David as the captain, they succeed, they win. David comes back home victorious, gets even more clout because of that. Um, David is given permission to then marry Saul's daughter. So he marries Saul's daughter. David feels really inadequate. He's like, oh, I can't marry the, the daughter of Saul. Um, but that does end up happening. And um, that's pretty much where we end. That's where we end. Now, we don't study the rest of 1 Samuel. Next week, when we pick up, we'll be in 2 Samuel. So real quick, like in a minute, I'm just going to tell you what happens in the last 12 chapters of 1 Samuel that we skip over here, because I want to tell you about the ending of Saul. Basically, Saul starts to get even more hostile towards David to the point where it's very obvious that Saul is trying to kill David. It's not like subtle anymore. Now it's like, mm, yeah, we know what's going on. So David has to escape. He has to leave the land and go into hiding because Saul is just trying to kill him. Um, we learn that the prophet Samuel dies. So he dies, although Saul and Samuel didn't really have much of a connection at that point anyways. And then there's a big battle um, and Saul leads his people out to battle, but he kind of it's like he knows. He knows that Samuel wasn't there as the prophet to like tell him how to be successful. He knows that there's no spirit of the Lord with him and Saul is killed in battle and most of his sons are killed in battle as well. Um, so it's just kind of this ending, this big ending to Saul, Saul's reign as the king of all Israel. And that's about where we end up. We'll pick up next week to see how David's story continues after this, now that he is able to come out of hiding because Saul is gone. Okay, that's the story for this week, you guys. Like, lots of dramatic details. Also, some famous stories, of course. I know everyone in the world knows about David and Goliath, but I love seeing how it all fits in. Um, I think my personal spiritual focus, though, is going to be about that phrase that Samuel says to King Saul about to obey is better than to sacrifice, because I've heard that before. And I'm not going to lie, I... It hasn't really clicked for me on exactly what that means, but seeing it in the context of this story, um, obeying the Lord's commandment was more important than disobeying it so that they could make sacrifices, even though that seemed like a worthy cause in Saul's mind. Um, I think that's a really interesting concept. So I'm going to ponder on that, but I'm also going to think about how can I make sure my obedience to God 
is at the top of my priority list. It's above everything else. Because I think that's what the Lord's wanting to teach is that's how you stay successful is by putting obedience at the top. Okay, hope you have a great week this week. Um, learning about these fascinating people, Samuel, Saul, David, lots of names going on. Um, really interesting stories as well, but also some powerful spiritual lessons too. Okay, have a great week this week and happy studying.